So Chris, I got a really basic question for you to start. Okay. What's the model of this speaker? Uh, this is the Raven 3. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Got the hard questions out of the yeah. way right up front. It's real. I like this wood finish. Thanks. This is nice. How many finishes do you offer? Uh, I have uh, two different uh, woods. I have ash and walnut. And then uh, I, I can do the ash with a clear coat, and I can also do the ash as a black dyed ash. Yeah. Um, and then, but they're all going to be a clear coat that is going to still reveal the, the kind of nature and quality of the wood. It's mm -hmm. not going to be like a hard uh, varnish. I'm not really a big fan of hard, glossy, clear coats. Okay. It just looks plasticky to me. Yeah, it looks like making plastic, something out right. of wood, you know. Looks like fake wood. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good. Now, meanwhile, you you make the cabinets in house. This is all you, right? Yeah, yeah. My my team and and I, um, we've got a wood shop, uh, machine shop, and metal fabrication in our shop in Richmond, Virginia. So we have machines for taking rough sawn boards and turning them into finished material, and then uh, a clamp carrier to glue the boards up to be the right width, uh, and then we process them to the next point, put the miters in them, drill in and mill the holes, the mortises for the, the tenon joints in the in the corners to make the... Wait, what's a tenon joint? So a mortise and tenon is when you have a, a pocket and then the tenon is a piece, like a, a wood piece, a mechanical fastener that gets glued in so that you actually, when you're gluing two ends of wood together, the glue joints don't work really well on the ends of wood, but they work really well on the sides of, of wood. So the mechanical fastener, a tenon, allows you to get those joints that work well in gluing wood together inside of an end joint. So when you have a miter joint like this, you're actually connecting to the end, end grain of two pieces of wood. So we mortise in pockets in four places, and we made right angle biscuits or tenons that you fit in, and when you push it in, it really locks that miter joint together. Uh, okay. So. Wow. But is there any additional bracing inside the cabinet? No. Uh, if you have, if you're using solid wood construction, you have to account for uh, the expansion and contraction of the wood. So if you put bracing in uh, to connect the front and the back of the speaker together, um, then the side walls of the enclosure would be expanding and contracting and resisting what the brace isn't doing, and then you'd be warping and putting stress on the construct. Mm. So. What you really want is you want the box to move and do what it needs to do without damage. Um, and then we used engineered wood and panel products for the front and the back because that doesn't expand and contract in, uh, in the direction that would put strain on the outer part. What is engineered wood? Well, like plywood. Plywood, okay. You know, plywood, uh, veneer core plywood is an is a engineered panel product. Um, so, um, you know, they're, they're making multiple layers of veneer and then gluing all of that together. Okay. And so it's designed not to, in the direction of the X and Y of the panel, it doesn't expand and contract this way. It's very stable. Right. Okay. So that's why it's good for a panel. So the port, by the way, what, how, is this, how deep is the port tube? Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you exactly, but it's a r around four inches. Okay. Um, you know, it could, it could be like three and five eighths or okay. four and a quarter. I don't I'm remember. I'm not that precise. You know that. <laughs> we, we, you know, tried three or four different ones, you know, we, we did calculations and then we built three or four different versions and listened to a bunch of music and I picked the one that I felt like was the most musical. There you go. By the way, before I forget, are there grills? Do you do grills? I don't do grills. Um, I respect that. <laughs> well, I asked my wife about it when I first made them and I, you know, I was like, do you think I need to make a grill? And I had put a lot of energy into making the baffle material nice and and uh, she said no I like it and I was like okay that's good enough for me that was my focus group <laughs> that's a focus group that was focus my focus group, group. one yeah. it's very focused but it, it was one of those things where you know how much am I going to include is also always one of the things that as a product developer I have to think about do I um, you know, do I have every single bell and whistle? Do I have an op options all over the place, you know? Or do I stick to my guns and try to elevate the value in other places so that I'm not spending money needlessly to satisfy a small percentage? And the grills are complicated to make and 
if you sold them separately, nobody would want to pay a lot for them. So you end up making them and storing a lot of them and only selling a few of them. So, you know, if I lose some sales because I don't have grills, I just kind of said, okay, that's the deal. Yeah, we have a lot of fellas like to look at the drivers. <laughs> so the, the driver itself is made by CS? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. But it's specific to, to you? Yeah, um, I had been working with them for several years, working with their um, Seas Exotic series, uh, which is a, a really phenomenal driver that was developed for a DIY market. Um, and I thought it was just great sounding. Um, there were some things I really wanted to, um, I wanted to go in a different direction with the sound from what that driver was and I wanted my own uh, my own branded driver and so that was a that was a, a big want with a, a wide open field of questions for me how do I do this what do I how do I accomplish this and I um, been talking to them for a number of years and I decided to go to Munich one year and um, told them that I was coming and they invited me to go to the factory in Norway so I flew up there for a couple days and met the team up there, the engineers, the people building the drivers, and had a great time. And, um, and then we kind of embarked on a process um, looking at one of their drivers and then talking about how we could change it. And um, so I told them what I was wanting to accomplish. And then um, we decided to make four or five different versions that I could I could try out right and um, that uh, that was great because it allowed me to really experience the difference and compare it to the thing that I was already very comfortable and you know confident with um, and I ended up choosing choosing one of those and then from there uh, and that was all in a prototype cabinet um, from there, I then went back and fine-tuned all of the design of the cabinet, the porting, damping, um, all of that other stuff. Mm. That's so, great. Yeah. Now, it's a, it's a full range driver. Yeah. So there's no crossover. There's nothing between we, the, in, the, the, the connectors and the driver? No, we have some contouring in there. Oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, you know, what, what I found was that, uh, and, and this is the, the challenge with any full range driver is you're asking it to do a hell of a lot. And, um, you know, you can spend tons of money uh, engineering every single thing out of, uh, out, you know, out of every a single driver to make it accomplish everything that you want. Uh, but there's always some challenges with mechanical resonance and things like that. Um, and one of the things that we found um, after, you know, basically uh, about a year um, was that we we found there was a, a couple hot spots that we needed to address um, and you know that was going through and, and diagnosing what we were uh, seeing and testing after we had heard the things that we heard and gotten some feedback um, was a you know about a six month process mm -hmm. to really dig into it and then figure out what we were going to do um, how we were going to serve our clients that had already bought them and um, and so then we developed you know uh, a circuit that we put in and, and you know addressed those hot spots and okay yeah okay that's that's good see I, I wasn't expecting that but it makes perfect sense yeah I think everybody wants a, a full range driver to just be a wire from the right, driver right. to the amplifier yeah, silly me but um, I mean, it's it's this idea of like, well, I don't want anything to go in between. But like, great speaker design actually requires a lot of vigorous investigation and and you know work to address things to make it sound the best. And um, it's still not a crossover because you're not um, you're not managing what two drivers are doing. You have one voice coil still, and uh, but you're you know adjusting some contours. And on the back. The, the connectors are Cardis? They're Cardis, and, and, but I'm actually starting to use something else that I've developed, yeah. Oh. I'm not You're making I'm it in-house? No, I'm not making it in-house. Oh. 
is, uh, adding all the plastics pieces and the, the plating is, is too complicated. I'd be making $300 terminals. So. <laughs> and the internal wire? The internal wire is Black Cat. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And I'm, I'm impressed. So uh, you sell it. That now we're leaning the, the speakers back a little bit on a on a riser. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. But yeah. that's optional. That's that that's comes optional. with it. Yeah. Uh, and and the idea is that um, I didn't make speakers that are really tall because I want them to fit into more spaces visually and mm -hmm. be complementary with people's living spaces. And if you have speakers that are taller than 34, 36 inches, they start to dominate the room. And for some people that's okay, but for a lot of people um, and their life partners, it's not. Right. So, you know, making speakers that are a little bit more compact and um, was important to me. And I knew from uh, the Quad 57s that I have that leaning them back actually can adjust the, the orientation to head height. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Did, I, did we miss anything? Um, so the front baffle is made out of rich light, which is a recycled uh, paper and phenolic resin. Um, it's um, a very hard, durable, stable material that I use for my turntables as well. No, I guess that's it. I, I, I just, my goal in making them was to make speakers that would satisfy the most people playing the most different kinds of music um, and I know that I wouldn't necessarily be able to satisfy everyone and I wouldn't be able to necessarily you know beat out every single other pair of speakers but I'm trying to make the best speaker that I can for the most people right you know? but it is a high sensitivity design yeah it's, it's about 94 DB uh, it's very uh, easy to drive uh, I run it with uh, low power amps like a 7 watt 300 B all the way up to 200 watt uh, integrated, like Dan uh, Dan Wright's from Modrite. Okay. So um, and all the LTA amps do a great job with it. And I just I, that's another thing is that making a high sensitivity speaker means it it can play well with more amps. Right. Now you sell direct, but also through brick and mortar. Uh, I don't really have any uh, dealers right now. It's something that I've been exploring and, and interested in, um, but mostly I sell direct. And what about for export? Uh, I, I sell direct internationally as well. Okay. Yeah. And warranty? Um, somebody has a problem, I take care of them. Ah, I like that. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, the real thing is uh, building trust and having relationships with my clients. and. Um, I, I really care about this and want it to succeed, so having happy clients or even happy non-clients, if they, <laughs> you know, is really important, you know. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thanks, Steve.